At the bar, Zaphod was rapidly becoming as tired as a newt. His heads knocked together and his smiles were coming out of sync. He was miserably happy. Zaphod, said Ford, whilst you're still capable of speech, would you care to tell me what the photon happened? Where have you been? Where have we been? Small matter, but I'd like it cleared up. Zaphod's left head sobered up, leaving his right to sink further into the obscurity of drink. Yeah, he said. I've been around. They want me to find the man who rules the universe, but I don't care to meet him. I believe the man can't cook. His left head watched his right head saying this and then nodded. True, it said. Have another drink. Ford had another pangalactic gargle blaster, the drink which has been described as the alcohol equivalent of a mugging. Expensive and bad for the head. Whatever had happened, Ford decided, he didn't really care too much. Listen, Ford, said Zaphod. Everything's cool and fruity. You mean everything's under control? No, said Zaphod. I do not mean everything's under control. That would not be cool and fruity. If you want to know what happened, let's just say I had the whole situation in my pocket, okay? Ford shrugged. Zaphod giggled into his drink. It frothed up over the side of the glass and started to eat its way into the marble tabletop. A wild-skinned sky gypsy approached them and played electric violin at them until Zaphod gave him a lot of money and he agreed to go away. The gypsy approached Arthur and Trillian sitting at another part of the bar. I don't know what this place is, said Arthur, but I think it gives me the creeps. Have another drink, said Trillian. Enjoy yourself. Which, said Arthur, the two are mutually exclusive. Poor Arthur, you're really not cut out for this life, are you? You call this life? You're beginning to sound like Marvin. Marvin's the clearest thinker I know. How do you think we make this violinist go away? The waiter approached. Your table is ready, he said. Seen from the outside, which it never is, the restaurant resembles a giant glittering starfish beached on a forgotten rock. Each of its arms houses the bars, the kitchens, the force field generators which protect the entire structure and the decayed planet on which it sits, and the time turbines which slowly rock the whole affair backwards and forwards across the crucial moment. In the center sits the gigantic golden dome, almost a complete globe, and it was into this area that Zaphod, Ford, Arthur, and Trillian now passed. At least five tons of glitter alone had gone into it before them and covered every available surface. The other surfaces were not available because they were already encrusted with jewels, precious seashells from Centragonus, gold leaf, mosaic tiles, lizard skins, and a million unidentifiable embellishments and decorations. Glass glittered, silver shone, gold gleamed, Arthur Dent goggled. Wowee, said Zaphod. Zappo. Incredible, breathed Arthur. The people. The things. Things, said Ford Prefect quietly, are also people. The people, resumed Arthur. The... the other people. The lights, said Trillian. The tables, said Arthur. The clothes, said Trillian. The waiter thought they sounded like a couple of bailiffs. The end of the universe is very popular, said Zaphod, threading his way unsteadily through the throng of tables. Some made of marble, some of rich ultra mahogany, some even of platinum, and at each, a party of exotic creatures chatting amongst themselves and studying menus. People like to dress up for it, continued Zaphod. Gives a sense of occasion. The tables were fanned out in a large circle around a central stage area where a small band were playing light music. At least a thousand tables with Arthur's guests, and interspersed among them were swaying palms, hissing fountains, grotesque statuary. In short, all the paraphernalia common to all restaurants where little expense had been spared to give the impression that no expense had been spared. Arthur glanced around, half expecting to see someone making an American Express commercial. 
Zaphod lurched into Ford, who lurched back into Zaphod. Wowee, said Zaphod. Zappo, said Ford. My great granddaddy must have really screwed up the computer's works, you know, said Zaphod. I told it to take us to the nearest place to eat, and it sends us to the end of the universe. Remind me to be nice to it one day. He paused. Hey, everybody's here, you know. Everybody who was anybody. Was? said Arthur. At the end of the universe, you have to use past tense a lot, said Zaphod. Because everything's been done, you know. Hi, guys, he called out to a nearby party of giant iguana life forms. How do you do? Is that Zaphod Beeblebrox? asked one iguana of another iguana. I think so, replied the second iguana. Well, doesn't that just take the biscuit, said the first iguana. Funny old thing, life, said the second iguana. It's what you make of it, said the first, and they lapsed back into silence. They were waiting for the greatest show in the universe. Hey, Zaphod, said Ford, grabbing for his arm, and on account of the third pangalactic gargle blaster missing, he pointed a swaying finger. There's an old man of mine, he said. Hot black Dasiato. See the man at the platinum table with the platinum suit on? Zaphod tried to follow Ford's finger with his eyes, but it made him feel dizzy. Finally, he saw. Oh, yeah, he said. Then recognition came a moment later. Hey, he said. Did that guy ever make it mega big? Wow. Bigger than the biggest thing ever. <laughs> Other than me. Who's that supposed to be? Asked Trillian. Hot Black Desiato. Hot Black Desiato? Said Zaphod in astonishment. You don't know? You never heard of Disaster Area? No, said Trillian, who hadn't. The biggest, said Ford. Loudest. Richest, suggested Zaphod. Rock band in the history of... He searched for the word. History itself, said Zaphod. No, said Trillian. Zowie, said Zaphod. Here we are at the end of the universe and you haven't lived yet. Did you miss out? He led her off to where the waiter had been waiting all this time at the table. Arthur followed them, feeling very lost and alone. Ford waded off through the throng to renew an old acquaintance. Hey, Hot Black, he called out. How you doing? Great to see you, big boy. How's the noise? You're looking great. Really very, very fat and unwell. Amazing. He slapped a man on the back and was mildly surprised that it seemed to elicit no response. The pan-galactic gargle blasters swirling around him told him to plunge on regardless. Remem remember the old days? He said. We used to hang out, right? The beast are illegal, remember? Slim's throat emporium. The evil drum boozerama. Great days, eh? Hot Black Desiato offered no opinion as to whether they were great days or not. Ford was not perturbed. And when we were hungry, we posed as public health inspectors. Do you remember that? And we go around confiscating meals and drinks, right? Till we got food poisoning. Oh, and there were the long nights of talking and drinking in those smelly rooms above Cafe Lou in Gretchen Town, New Bethel. And you were always in the next room, trying to write songs on your agitar, and we all hated them. And you said you didn't care. And we said we did, because we hated them so much. Ford's eyes were beginning to mist over. And you said... You didn't want to be a star, he continued, wallowing in nostalgia, because you despise the star system. And we said, Hydra and Sully Joe and me, that we didn't think you had the option. And what do you do now? You buy star systems. He turned and solicited the attention of the nearby tables. Here, he said, is a man who buys star systems. 
Hot Black Desiato made no attempt either to confirm or deny this fact, and the attention of the temporary audience waned rapidly. I think someone's drunk, muttered a purple bush-like being into his wine glass. Ford staggered slightly and sat down heavily on the chair facing Hot Black Desiato. What's that number you do? He said, unwisely grabbing at a bottle for support and tipping it over. Into a nearby glass as it happened. Not to waste a happy accident, he drained the glass. That really huge number, he continued. How does it go? Barm, barm, butter, something, and the stage act you do, it ends up with a ship crashing right into the sun. And you actually do it. Ford crashed his fist into his other hand to illustrate this feat graphically. He knocked the bottle over again. Ship, sun, wham, bang, he cried. I mean, forget lasers and stuff. You guys are into solar flares and real sunburn. Oh, and terrible songs. His eyes followed the stream of liquid glugging out of the bottle onto the table. Something ought to be done about that, he thought. Hey, you want a drink? He said. It began to sink into his squelching mind that something was missing from this reunion and that the missing something was in some way connected with the fact that the fat man sitting opposite him in the platinum suit and the silver trilby had not yet said, Hi, Ford, or great to see you after all this time, or in fact, anything at all. More to the point, he had not yet even moved. Hot block, said Ford. A large meaty hand landed on his shoulder from behind and pushed him aside. He slid gracelessly off his seat and peered upward to see if he could spot the owner of this discourteous hand. The owner was not hard to spot, on account of his being something in the order of seven feet tall and not slightly built with it. In fact, he was built the way one builds leathery sofas. Shiny, lumpy, and with lots of solid stuffing. The suit into which the man's body had been stuffed looked as if its only purpose in life was to demonstrate how difficult it was to get this sort of body into a suit. The face had the texture of an orange and the color of an apple, but that was where the resemblance to anything sweet ended. Kid, said a voice which emerged from the man's mouth as if it had been having a really tough time down in his chest. <clears throat> uh, yeah, said Ford conversationally. He staggered back onto his feet again and was disappointed that the top of his head hadn't come further up the man's body. Beat it, said the man. Oh yeah? Said Ford, wondering how wise he was being. And who are you? The man considered this for a moment. He wasn't used to being asked this sort of question. Nevertheless, after a while, he came up with an answer. I'm the guy who's telling you to beat it, he said, before you get it beaten for you. Now listen, said Ford nervously. He wished his head would stop spinning, settle down, and get to grips with the situation. Now listen, he continued. I am one of Hot Black's oldest friends, and... He glanced back at Hot Black Desiato, who still hadn't moved so much as an eyelash. And, said Ford again, wondering what would be a good word to say after and. The large man came up with a whole sentence to go after and. He said it. And I am Mr. Desiato's bodyguard, it went. And I am responsible for his body. And I am not responsible for yours. So take it away before it gets damaged. Now, wait a minute, said Ford. No minutes, boomed the bodyguard. No waiting. Mr. Desiato speaks to no one. Well, perhaps you'd let him say what he thinks about the matter himself, said Ford. He speaks to no one, bellowed the bodyguard. Ford glanced back at Hoplock again and was forced to admit to himself that the bodyguard seemed to have the facts on his side. There was still not the slightest sign of movement, let alone keen interest in Ford's welfare. Why? said Ford. What's the matter with him? The 
bodyguard told him. I hope you'll join us at the restaurant at the end of the universe when the next chapter drops very soon. <laughs>